UETV is pleased to present a two-part forum hosted by the University of the West Indies, Brock University and the Canada Caribbean Institute entitled Seasonal Farm Workers in Canada During the COVID-19 Pandemic. In part one, our two presenters are Dr. Talia Esnard and Dr. Simon Brown. Welcome to our forum on seasonal farm workers in Canada during the COVID-19 crisis. My name is Richard Bernal. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs at the University of the West Indies, and I will be your moderator. Let me begin by welcoming all of you who are participating, beginning with the Diplomatic and Consular Corps, our colleagues, particularly those at Brock University and the University of the West Indies, as well as other universities and research institutes across Canada. I welcome all interested researchers, participants, and in particular, the media. This afternoon, we are going to be having the first forum presented by the Institute, the Caribbean Canada Institute, which was launched in February of this year. It is a, it's jointly anchored between Brock University and the University of the West Indies. Those two universities will constitute a core of a network of interested universities and research institutes. This afternoon, we are going to proceed in the following way. We are going to have four presentations of approximately 15 minutes, and then we will be taking questions to which the panelists will, will respond. We have decided to have this forum at this time because there has recently been quite a lot of interest expressed in public media in the issue of seasonal farm workers in Canada. The background to this is that this program of seasonal farm workers in Canada has run very successfully for many years with persons participating from several countries. Indeed, from Jamaica alone, there is said to be some 10,000 persons who participate in this program annually. The program is invaluable to the um, Canadian agricultural sector because it provides labor at a critical time of harvesting. And it is important to the countries from which the workers come because it is valuable employment and an important source of foreign exchange. The proceedings will go in the following order. Dr. Talia Esnard, lecturer in sociology, faculty of social science, University of the West Indies at the St. Augustine campus will lead off speaking about strengthening structures and practices of migrant farm work, a case for critical and public agendas. She will be followed by Dr. Simon Black, Assistant Professor, Labor Studies, Faculty of Social Science, Brock University. He will speak on migrant worker justice and the COVID-19 pandemic. After that, we will have a presentation by Dr. Lisette Vasnu, Professor, Biological Science, Faculty of Mathematics and Science, Brock University, and UNESCO Chair in Community Sustainability. She will speak about foreign workers and essential service in the Canadian agricultural sector and how to protect them. Our fourth and final presentation will be by Dr. Claudette Crawford Brown, lecturer in clinical social work, faculty of social science, University of the West Indies at the Mona campus. And her topic will be psychosocial implications 
of migrant farm workers in Canada in the COVID-19 pandemic. Without further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Talia Esnard to make her presentation. All right, so, so as uh, Professor Bernal, thank you as well for facilitating this particular forum, very timely indeed. Um, and not just timely, what I would show through the presentation is that there are many long-standing issues that relate to migrant farm work that do not get that level of critical and public visibility um, that is necessary to really perhaps enhance, strengthen, build on what presently exists. And I say that because there is somewhat of an acceptance that this particular module of farm work that exists in Canada is really one that amounts to something of a best practice. And this is said in the context and in comparison to other models of this particular kind of labor mobility program that exists in the US and beyond. But when we look at this particular program, I think it's important to pause, despite the somewhat of a position that this particular module is or amounts to a best practice, there are some underlying structural um, and systemic issues that really challenge the ability for stakeholders to really develop this program and enhance it in a way for which it has the potential to be. And I would like to pause particularly to look at this, this structural necessity of this particular program and start with a recognition that this particular program really has benefits from multiple stakeholders. So if we look at a layered approach to this, to understanding this particular sort of program, we could start with the level of the economy and look at what it does in terms of export um, for Canada and what it does at the level of the state in terms of um, relations and bilateral agreements between nation states we look at the level between employers and what it does for farmers, a very critical and essential source of labor to sustain that sort of agricultural activity. And of course, we recognize the workers who are fundamentally um, part of this particular program and on which this particular, um, partic particular program stands. And this, this is really where I would like to take us this afternoon to center on the experiences of the workers and to look at some of the challenges and structural aspects of the program that affect them in ways that are concerning, but also um, in ways for which I think require some critical and public agendas. And to start off, I would like to say that when we look at the program beside the necessity of it and its functional utility, we see some worrisome and some concerning trends. What we know, just reviewing some of the literature that exists, is that there's really a lack of, of macro and microanalysis that connects very, very important issues of liberalism, of work culture and structure, employment regulations, and venues for seeking social justice. There, there is a lack of literature too, and really a lack of centering of the experiences of those workers. And that particular understanding and, and that observation, in, in essence, indirectly makes them an invisible population, even though they may be deemed as essential. And that lack of visibility of, on, on the experience really then does not give relevance to issues of well being, the positionality, and issues of mobility. And when we take that into consideration, what this calls for is really a critical example examination of some of the systemic issues as I've mentioned, and some of the practices that deepen the political, economic, and social vulnerabilities of this particular group. And this is really where the presentation takes us this afternoon. So what is the political vulnerability? What are that political vulnerability for which now I speak? What do you see? Certainly, if I just screen through and scan that literature and look at the um, the articles and the online information and reports that exist, I see a long-standing issue and concern 
for how workers and seasonal migrants are constructed in this particular context. They are described, for example, as permanently temporary, legal but deportable, and critical but expendable. And I look as well at the economic vulnerability of those workers. And I ask the question, what are the particular frameworks through which those workers are constructed to fit that bill? And that, by that bill, I mean to be deemed suitable for seasonal agricultural work. And what I see when I ask that question, very interesting trends. A lack of, they are there, there's an understanding or position in that literature that there's a lack of transparency around the um, pathways to residency, what they are getting as part of this particular program, what they are afforded, whether they have opportunities to um, save, to be permanent, to move, to be mobile while they are there on those um, farms. And of course, this is even more relevant in the context of the recent waiver that they were asked to sign for those persons who left Jamaica most recently to go to um, Canada. And in a recent program, radio program that is in Jamaica, one particular concern will, was what were the conditions for those new migrants to leave? They were reminded in that particular program that they were not new migrants, but that they were existing seasonal farm workers who are returning to the farm. But the, the contention really was around, were they insured and how are they going to be protected in this particular context where COVID is a serious concern? The transparency around that is something that requires some sort of answer. Then I also look and I see a position and an argument of an inherent competitive system of recruitment that really looks to recruit and to take in persons who are hardworking and flexible. And those notions really reproduce that neoliberal subjectivity. And that the harder you work and the more you could tolerate, then the better you are suited for this kind of work. Of course, this introduces many concerns about the clarity of that particular context and whether those workers are really being further embedded in a system of vulnerability. And if that is the case, how do we address something such as this? There's concern about the selection process that goes deeper to look at the worthiness of migrants. And by worthiness, we see certain prisms of race and gender and class and nat nationality coming within that discussion. And what particularly emerges is really a discussion of whether, whether Mexicans are better um, workers perhaps than Caribbean persons, whether women are better suited for the farm than men, um, what class of workers are we particularly trying to recruit? And that creates a whole conversation about particular social strata and, and the suitability of a particular stratum for this particular kind of employment. There's a, a really a, a, another conversation taking place about whose interests does this particular farm work serve? And when I look deeper, I see a conversation about the interest and authority of the technocrats and investors. But I also know through my own work and interview of farm workers that the women, the men, they are also serving not just the farm workers and the technocrats, they are also serving themselves. They are serving their families. They are trying to find ways to move beyond where they are. And that is important, to move beyond where they are, not to stay there, but to experience mobility, to see, have hope in a process, and to move in a way that creates meaning, not just for themselves, but for every single one that they serve. And that is important. When we go further and we look at the issue of social vulnerability, what do we see? And I ask and I frame that question around this. How do the structures and practices really frame the contextual and the perceptual reality of and for workers? And 
one thing stands out, the restrictive living and working conditions that the workers meet on arrival and, and within the stay and the period on the farm. And the several things emerge from that conversation, several things. And I try to sum it up in, as much, in a way that, that what we could understand and make sense of the different layers right, that exist within that particular discussion. And what we see again is an argument that there's an intensification of self-discipline and there's a hyper-normative notion of self. There's hyper-productive transnational workforce that is developing in that process. And it's hyper-normative because of how they are curtailed and how there are restraints of movement and whether they allow or to unfold in a way that defines that agricultural farm worker and the expectations that come with that particular definition. But we also have to understand that there's another connection to this. On what is this art? Develop, managed, and sustained by these very same markers of difference, by differentiation on the farm based on gender of race, racism and name on racial name calling. And this of, uh, again came out of interviews um, in my own work as well as others who have done work in this area. And there are many other processes of at least racialization and gendered. Um, processes happening on the farm for which those workers are having an issue and for which researchers and others are writing on and for which activists I'm also aware of are trying to speak to and to use their voice to make a difference on behalf of those workers. But it's important and I note particularly that there's another sub-discussion happening there that says that it's not just a system of surveillance but it's also a practice of authority on the grounds of fear. And that conversation is one that speaks to how persons of influence and in authority use fear to subdue, to silence, to manipulate, to get what they want done. And the question that emerges from that is, is this happening on the plantation? Is this happening, and I say plantation, and it's not a Freudian slip, is a word that was used in, 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 and by certain researchers to describe this particular farm work system. I am, I am not sure if I'm readily um, using that in a very loose way to describe the plantation, to describe that farm work, but in essence, and, and really in, and in this particular um, presentation, to look at the concerns that are there. So that reference to plantation may not necessarily be a representation of what it is, but perhaps a metaphor for what it allows others to think of. And, and when I look at my own work and I look at my interviews with those farm workers, I remember very distinctively one worker sharing of having gone through surgery for fibroids, for fibroids and not being able to tell her employer that she went through surgery and worked on the farm for six weeks when she's supposed to be on bed rest. So when you hear those type of things, you know, you ask yourself, why would that happen? And if this is not a real issue as it exists, then why is there a perception that there's a culture of silence? So the question is, how do we now understand those narratives in a way that for us to really make sense of what exists and where those perceptions and those contextual understandings would have emerged? But I really want to note a broader conversation about the precarious nature of work for those neoliberal mothers. And, and my particular research was around single parents, mothers who, who have left the region, who have gone to become seasonal farm workers. And, and one particular person who stands out in my mind, who have used the farm work for several years, came from living in a household with four persons spending years on that farm, sending money for her two daughters to attend the University of the West Indies in Mona campus. One graduated as a lawyer and the other one 
into gender studies with a master's degree, and then returned and built herself a home where every single household member had a room of their own. Those narratives, those stories are important for us to recognize there's a vulnerability, but there's a prospect, there's a hope in this process. And that hope in this process is about the possibilities of what this particular program could do. But then it raises deeper questions of what are the, the, the systemic issues and the deeper issues that allow um, for curbing of those possibilities. And finally, how could we move beyond that to create a very sustainable, enjoyable, fruitful, empowering process and system that in the last particular point here, enhances the physiological, mental, and productive health of those workers. I wanna move on then to the question of how do we strengthen those structures? So we have a sense of the, the structures and the practices and the conditions and the issues that are, are here. But we must now turn our attention to how then do we strengthen those structures and some of these practices? So on a scholarly level, I think there's a need for a critical type of analysis, a critical sociology that really looks at the global structures, the global economy and the global class inequalities and racial hierarch hierarchies and gender hierarchies that exist. And how then do we use the research to disrupt that, all right? And, and, and one of the things, as I said, is for us to understand the structures and the weaving of power within those structures. And how then could we recreate a subjectivity that is not seen as subdued and silent and then capture the practices of resistance among those workers and how they really push back against the conditions and the policing and the surveillance. And also in that process to underscore the positions of vulnerability and invisibility that they are experiencing. But more importantly, to speak through, and I use this word through deliberately, through pedagogical explorations that teaches persons to transgress. And that is important. In strengthening the structures, there's also a need for public agenda, a deeper public gaze into what is needed to disrupt the portability and the vulnerability of those migrant workers. And I call particularly for greater research and advocacy and engagement of that community that could collectively strengthen that promise of social justice, but the promise of a better life for which those migrants are, 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 are you know, centrally gravitating to. Build stronger and, and fight for stronger legislations and regulations that protect farm workers. But I want us to think very openly of really looking at more innovative conceptualizations of work and economic activity that centers on the relevance of taken for granted issues of happiness and fairness and freedom. And lastly, but by no means least, I am calling for greater strengthening of the support structures that buffer these structural and cultural fallouts of the process. And if those things are addressed and teased out in a way that allows for the possibilities around those to emerge, then there's hope. And for those workers, that word, and as simple as it is, it means a lot. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Esnard, for setting the, the stage for us outlining the issues, both on the Canadian and Caribbean side, the issues related to the vulnerabilities and rights of the individual workers and their experience. This forms an ideal starting point for this afternoon's discussion. Before I ask Dr. Simon Black to give his presentation, I wanted to mention that in the press recently, there has been much discussion of this issue. When the virus broke out, the issue came up as to whether people would take up the opportunities to go and work on farms in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
in Jamaica, a number of workers opted to take up those opportunities. They signed a release for the government saying that the government wouldn't be responsible for them if they experienced any health problems or difficulties while in Canada. However, I want to point out that the Canadian government has a very well-established program to take care of uh, migrant farm workers. It relates to the conditions of their housing, to the responsibility of the employers for a certain level of health care, et cetera. So there are issues on both sides and there are safeguards. Against that background, I now ask Dr. Simon Black, Assistant Professor, Labor Studies, Faculty of Social Science, Brock University, to talk about migrant worker justice and the COVID-19 pandemic. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banal. Thank you to the organizers and thank you to you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. So thank you to Dr. Esnard for, for kicking us off today. Uh, I am coming from a labor studies perspective with my presentation today, Migrant Worker Justice and the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what do I mean from a, a labor studies perspective? Uh, well, I believe that all workers should have access to decent work as defined by the International Labor Organization, work that is healthy and safe, characterized by dignity, respect, fairness, access to social protections and a uh, living wage. There will be some overlap with Dr. Esnard's presentation and uh, in those sections of my presentation, which where there is overlap, I'll try to move through more quickly and talk about the uh, immediate context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. The SOP or Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program was established in 1966 as the Caribbean Seasonal Workers Program. And it was established through an MOU between Jamaica and Canada. Other Commonwealth Caribbean states entered thereafter. Mexico entered in 1974. SOP is managed and implemented within a, a three-tier institutional uh, framework. The Canadian federal government responsible uh, for matters of immigration. Uh, provincial governments are responsible for matters of employment standards and occupational health and safety. And then there's the bilateral agreements between Canada and participating countries, which are manifest in, in MOUs. These are uh, agreements between the federal government and sending states uh, such as Jamaica contain a range of terms uh, around accommodation, travel, wage levels, and repatriation. The SOP authorizes uh, workers to remain in Canada for a temporary period, uh, as Dr. Esnard pointed out, of a period not exceeding eight months, but the program does allow for circularity, that is uh, return um, the following year. And many workers return for uh, a number of years. As Dr. Esnard pointed out, the SAW program uh, for those who study model uh, migration management and for the OECD is often held up, uh, I think problematically, uh, I would agree with Dr. Esnard on this point, uh, as a model program. SOP is said to constitute a, a triple win for migrant workers, sending states, and host states. Uh, Canada fills a labor shortage. Uh, employers have access to relatively cheap labor. Uh, the, uh, the program delivers, uh, as its proponents claim, social and economic benefits to migrant workers and their families back home. And remittances contribute to more diversified and sustainable economic development. One thing I think is lost in the public discourse around these programs, particularly in the Canadian context, and this won't be of news to many of you, um, is the broader historical context uh, for tempor temporary foreign worker programs such as SOP. These programs emerge out of uh, legacies of slavery and indentureship, uh, unfree labor, 
and within the context of global racialized capitalism. Temporary foreign worker programs have a long history of thrusting racialized workers into hyper-exploitative working conditions, and they cannot be understood independently from unequal relations between host states in the global north and sending states in the global south, uh, processes of ongoing resource extraction, histories of dependency and underdevelopment, or policies pursued by rich countries like Canada uh, and other countries in the global north through multilateral institutions such as the IMF and structural adjustment programs. I think why is it necessary to highlight this context? It's necessary because in order to understand the current challenges and injustices facing migrant workers, we need to understand these challenges and injustices within the context of historical injustices. And as Dr. Esnard uh, pointed out, to be able to make these connections as well when thinking about what changes need to be made in order to promote decent work and social justice. The SOP program has been characterized often by uh, um, when it's appeared in the media between um, good employers and, and bad employers, that those migrant workers who experience poor working conditions, unhealthy and unsafe working conditions, uh, are just unlucky to be placed with a bad employer. But as Dr. Aznard mentioned, I'd, and I'd like to uh, reiterate this point, the, the vulnerability that workers through SOP experience is very much structural. It's a structural vulnerability that exists whether they're employed by a so-called good employer or a bad employer. SOP uh, operates on closed work permits that tie workers to a specific employer. Workers are still, despite years of advocacy and organizing, are still excluded from key labor protections and social rights. Uh, including overtime pay, uh, hours of work provisions. Uh, migrant farm workers through SOP cannot claim employment insurance or what we used to call unemployment insurance, although they pay into it and they have their uh, EI deductions made on their paychecks, nor can they access vacation and holiday pay. They experience uh, geographic and social isolation. And as Dr. Esnard mentioned, there's no pathway to permanent residency and citizenship. The closed work permit makes these workers particularly vulnerable to the threat and reality of deportation and of blacklisting as well. So again, this vulnerability and precariousness that migrant farm works experience is structural in nature. The governance of the program, um, from its very beginning has brought together governments and employers ver via uh, industry associations. But on the whole, workers are excluded from the governance of the program itself. And the rationale for this has always been that the sending state, in the context we're talking today, the sending state being Jamaica, uh, represents workers through uh, various liaison and consular services, for example, through a liaison officer who would mediate on-farm disputes between a worker and uh, an employer. But as Dr. Aznard uh, highlighted, the question of deport deportability, the threat and reality of deportation, and the unfree character of this labor really uh, gets at the difference between rights on paper, the modest right that seasonal agricultural workers and migrant farm workers have, and the exercise of those rights in practice. Here's an article from the New York Times a couple of years ago about foreign farm workers in Canada fearing deportation if they complain, and a number of uh, farm workers from Jamaica there um, depicted in the photograph along with the article. Moving now to the question of, of public health. Some excellent research by scholars, um, Carrie Prebish and um, Jill Hensbury uh, in, in around the H1N1 pandemic or H1N1 uh, influenza, um, saw that popular portrayals of migrant workers in Canadian press and in the Canadian uh, public discourse more broadly were as uh, migrant workers as vectors of disease. Uh, but as their research points out, the reality is that migrant workers are often healthier upon entry than counterparts in host countries, 
or their non-migrating peers. They arrive healthy, but they work in jobs with existing health and safety concerns. Those health risks uh, include those associated with substandard working or living conditions, for example, insufficient toilet or hand washing facilities, overcrowding in accommodations such as bunkhouses, and poor sanitation. This research found that migrant farm workers may not seek health care due to language barriers, work schedules, which don't allow them to, uh, given the long hours of work, to uh, go see a doctor, a walk-in clinic, or a hospital, or for fear that the use of health services might threaten their employment or immigration status. As such, migrant workers' vulnerability may lead to delays or failure to report health concerns or receive treatment. And again, this research by Prebish and Hempery was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 2011. So we are talking nine years before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. So very prescient in terms of looking at public health challenges facing migrant farm workers and the SOP more broadly. In terms of migrant farm worker health, uh, an investigative report done by uh, reporters with the Toronto Star that focused on the complaints made to or grievances made um, from 2003 onwards to the Ministry of Labor in Mexico by migrant farm workers from that sending state um, found through, as it, as it at least through 3,100 uh, grievances that were made in the period between 2003 and 2019, found a number of complaints, hundreds even, related to migrant worker health. The investigative reporters found that more than 450 complaints from Mexican farm workers uh, were made when they fell ill, and they said that medical treatment they were entitled to as Canadian taxpayers, because they do pay taxes, was denied or delayed, sometimes with life and death consequences. So this again gets at the disconnect between rights that migrant farm workers have in practice and the, the program as advertised and as uh, migrant farm workers experience their living and working conditions and participation in the SOP. In the context, the immediate context of the COVID-19 pandemic, migrant farm workers at first were uh, not exempted from the travel restrictions that were introduced by the government of Canada in mid-March. But an outcry from uh, the agricultural uh, industry and lobby groups um, led to the uh, extension of uh, exemptions to migrant farm workers. And in this uh, release, press release here by the government of Canada, migrant farm workers are said to be a vital, I quote, vital importance to the Canadian economy and their arrival essential uh, to so that planting and harvesting activities can take place. So what we've seen in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic really, is that migrant farm workers through SUP have really emerged from a relatively invisible and often characterizes low-skilled uh, group of workers to workers who are seen as skilled and essential to the Canadian economy. And you see here a news clip from the National Observer. Uh, uh, the National Observer spoke to uh, a number of farmers in Quebec who said that uh, it would take more than two Quebecers, 2.5 Quebecers they estimated, to replace one migrant worker from Guatemala to be working on their farm to be as productive. So there's a lot of um, discussion in Canada around whether unemployed, those who are uh, Canadians who are out of work, can do this sort of work. And when it's understood as low skilled work, then the assumption is that unemployed Canadians can do this work. But the reality is that farmer and farmers know this, and the growers associations and industry lobbies know this very much as well. This work is anything but low skilled. It is skilled, it requires training, and it requires years of practice and experience to become very good at it. There have been a number of COVID-19 outbreaks uh, in BC and Ontario um, in uh, farm working or migrant farm worker 
communities. These outbreaks, the, the first in BC and the first in Ontario, were amongst migrant farm workers uh, who were already in the country prior to the travel restrictions taking place. But I, I want to be clear that um, the outbreak in Ontario uh, at Green Hill Produce uh, began with uh, a non-migrant worker, with a Canadian uh, resident who was working on the farm, uh, who then spread the COVID-19 amongst the farm workers, the migrant workers uh, in that facility, on that farm. The Canadian government has taken a, a number of steps. The federal government has taken a number of steps to ensure that migrant farm workers remain healthy and safe and that their outbreaks, any outbreaks are contained, which include a two week isolation for migrant farm workers upon arrival. But again, the assumption is that migrant farm workers in this context are vectors of the disease and not uh, susceptible themselves to infection from the disease from Canadians working on the farm. The federal government has provided some support to farmers in recognition that uh, two-week isolation for migrant workers means that accommodations and wages uh, must be taken care of. And that support has come in the form of $1,500 per worker to assist with accommodation and pay during quarantine. Public health agencies, local public health agencies have been tasked with uh, inspection. But if we look at the outbreak uh, at Green Hill Produce in uh, southern or southwestern Ontario, um, this outbreak, as this headline from the London Free Press says, puts migrant farm workers in the spotlight. But again, the outbreak began with a local worker. And just a couple of days ago, uh, an advocacy organization by the, name, uh, by the name of Justicia for Migrant Workers or Justice for Migrant Workers, who for many years have been doing organizing and advocacy with farm workers in the SOP, uh, received a message from an anonymous migrant worker. That message from the Green Hill Farm said this, we want a voice, we are so afraid to talk, we are afraid we get sent back home. This is our job, this is how we survive, this is how we take care of our family. We needed to be treated as equal, everyone. Liaison officers who should be our advocate, we haven't uh, seen nor heard from them. So this is a farm that has been in the spotlight because of the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. But this particular worker, as they have sent this anonymous message to Justicia for migrant workers, is said that uh, many of the medical um, public health directives uh, that are uh, that have been uh, at least in, uh, in in policy implemented are not being implemented in practice on the farm that he works on he or she works on. A number of organizations, including Justicia for Migrant Workers, Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union in Canada have been organizing around migrant justice for many years. They have made repeated calls for reform that sometimes fall on deaf ears, other times have been taken into more serious cons consideration by the Canadian government. Ones that haven't been um, brought into uh, existed yet are equal access to labor protections and social entitlements for farm, farm workers working through the SOC full coverage under occupational health and safety statutes, access to collective bargaining in all jurisdictions. Only in some jurisdictions do um, uh, provinces, do migrant farm workers have legislated rights to organize into a union and to collectively bargain with their employers. Advocates have been demanding SOP specific anti-reprisal protections that would protect workers who are making complaints about uh, wages or working conditions or violations of their rights. Open work permits that allow uh, migrant farm workers to move um, between farms, between uh, employers, and are not um, uh, then tied to one particular or specific employer or farmer. They've been demanding pathways to permanent residency and citizenship. But within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
there are repeated calls for justice that uh, echo these previous calls, but also calls that are specific to the public health crisis and the experience of workers in that crisis, including the right to safe sanitary housing and working conditions that respect physical distancing protocols, an end to exclusions from basic labor protections, the right to paid sick leave for migrant farm workers, the extension of the provincial government in Ontario, there's been a, a provincial government wage boost for essential workers, the extension of that wage boost to farm workers who have been deemed essential, at least as far as um, the mobility in terms of immigration or migration to Canada for farm work, but have not by the provincial government been deemed essential or worthy for that matter of a wage boost that other essential workers in the province of Ontario uh, are due to receive. Expedited uh, appeals process for occupational health and safety and employment standards complaints. And the ability to, the right to claim uh, employment insurance, whether that farm workers in Canada or in the Caribbean or Mexico. There might be Jamaican farm workers who have decided after working many years uh, in Canada on farms have decided not to make the voyage to Canada this season. Yet that, that worker has for many years been paying into uh, employment insurance in Canada. Uh, well, advocates are arguing that that worker should have the ability to claim uh, employment insurance, what used to be called unemployment insurance, uh, even if they're residing in the Caribbean or Mexico. And also end employer wage deductions for protective necessary protective gear in the context of the pandemic. And finally, what we have really never seen when it comes to this program and what is more pressing, uh, a, more, um, um, a more important demand than ever, uh, is a robust proactive inspection and enforcement regime. So these are the calls for migrant worker justice we hear from unions, from migrant farm worker uh, advocacy organizations and activist groups. And on that note, uh, I'll end and here are some of my references. Thank you, Dr. Black, for that very interesting and insightful presentation.